Hello, welcome to Hot Pot. I'm your host, Joni Poon, stirring the pot on Asian BIPOC mental health and wellness. Welcome everyone to another podcast series. I am so excited to introduce to you Naomi Grace. Um, she is multi-talented and very knowledgeable when it comes to um, cultural pieces, especially with the her black culture and bringing all that in, as well as um, being sensory because she has had an interesting life. I don't want to disclose more. I would love her for her to share. I don't want to spoil it. So I'll start off in... Um, Asking, you know, like, where does your name come from, or what does it even mean? Yeah. Thanks for so much for welcoming me onto this podcast. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm really excited for this conversation. Um, and I'm really glad that you asked that question because I actually really like talking about my name. Mm. So my name was chosen by my mother. Mm. Um, my growing up in um, a Christian family, Catholic family. Um, it was important to have a biblical for important for both my parents to have a biblical for me to have a biblical name um, But my name is also was also chosen because it's something that can't be rhymed mm-hmm. or Conventionally shortened like mm-hmm. Jennifer becomes Jen, mm-hmm. you know, there's no real shortened shortened version for Naomi mm-hmm. um, My name is both Hebrew and Japanese mm-hmm. and I'm neither of those cultures <laughs> um, uh, In Hebrew it means pleasantness and in Japanese it means true beauty And when I was a kid, there was a book written by um, Japanese-Canadian author Joy Kagawa, and the book was called Naomi's Road. And it was like the first book that I saw with my name in it, and I I really, really, really loved loved it. Um, My last name is Grace Child, and that is a name that I chose for myself. Mm. Um, So my my name at birth um, was a name that, um, for a number of reasons, um, I never really felt like it was... Like when people would say it, it never really felt like they were talking about me. It never mm. felt like, yeah. Um, and it was also a name that was passed down um, in on that side of the family because of colonization, and it was like a reflection of, of a history of um, of oppression and violence. Um, but this idea of being able to claim my own identity as a human being was really mm-hmm. important. So. When you think about grace, grace is undeserved favor and is this redemptive, redemptive loving force. Mm-hmm. And when I think of back on both sides of my family about all of the various things that my my ancestors my ancestors survived, and even like you know my mother and my grandmother and you know even recent ones, mm-hmm. um, there are lots of reasons why I shouldn't be here. And even the fact that, like, by ver- the you know, by fact, the fact that I am actually alive and present on this planet, and the, you know, the, um, um, like, statistically, the likelihood of you know of life is really is quite slim. So, um, I, but I'm here, mm-hmm. so I am a child of grace, mm-hmm. grace child. So that's where that that's where that name comes oh. from. And as my artist handle, I shortened it. I shortened it to Naomi Grace, Naomi Grace rather than Grace Child. But yes, that is my legal name. Okay. It is one that, um, yeah, um, and that was during a whole um, period of my life where there was a lot of reclamation and reinvention and really stepping into. Well, I'm still, I'm still going through it. That stepping into um, my authenticity. Mm-hmm. That really shows your path and journey and it's really you're living your name yeah i hope so yeah, yeah. well i mean that's all i feel like it, when people's like i'm on my path and then i'm done i'm like well are we i, I feel personally please correct me if i'm wrong i per- personally feel like this ever journey that we're on as we discover ourselves and who we are and our identities it it shifts and grows as we become more and more authentic to what we feel is more aligned with our souls and Mm -hmm. then as we go through that that's an endless journey really even until the day we die but then something else begins like one cycle ends and comes another right yeah so it never doesn't really end i remember at one point in time i actually did say okay i'm good i'm i've reached it (laughs) and of course i was in my 20s right yeah Yeah. and i was like yeah this is it no i've got a handle on it i am like 
I'm good. <laughs> and then, yeah, no, I life was is sorely like, nope. mistaken. <laughs> life is like, nope. Yeah. <laughs> and it's okay to feel like that sometimes because it can be quite the journey and it can be hard sometimes. It's not always going to be smooth sailing. No. Right? And so it's just like maybe life giving you that respite. It's like, yeah, you're good for now. And... <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I remember in my teens and 20s feeling like I was so wise and that, you know, yeah, you couldn't tell me anything because I already, I already knew. And I sometimes, you know, I'm talking to younger folks who are going through that, 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 I'll say it. it's like, it's arrogant. It's, 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 it's arrogant and misguided. And I think that we've all gone through it at some point mm-hmm. in, in one way. So that's not, you know, to be, to try to be like, you know, der- like derogatory to, you know, yeah. but um, yeah, I've heard, you know, like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm wise and I'm this and that. Okay. Based on what right. they know, though. Yes, so, of course. So in their perspectives, yeah, I'm sure they are. Yeah. <laughs> but then compared to once they learn more, they're like, oh, now their scope and lens has widened. They're like, oh, I see a lot more now. Boy, was I wrong. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I love memes. And one of my favorite, so for anybody who's ever checked out my Instagram account, my stories are just like packed with memes. That's all mm-hmm. I do is just post memes. One of my favorite ones is one I have, I have saved to the desktop of my computer, and it says, do not erase. And the first panel is this seed saying, ah, oh, this is the life. I could stay here forever. And the second one is cracking like, oh, my God, what's happening? And they're like, ah, oh, the agony. Oh, my God, stop. And the last frame, it's just sprout above the ground like, oh, what's this? Yeah. And, um, yeah, every time I feel like I go through that cycle, like, you know, over and over and over and over and over again. Yeah. And I forget, like, when I'm in these, like, you know, these dark, dark nights of the soul and, yeah. the, you know to do a, an Anne of Green Gables quote, the depths of despair. <laughs> um, yeah, right afterwards, there's usually some sort of new revelation mm-hmm. or new, mm-hmm. um, like, big development or growth. But when you're in, like, you know, in that, like, yeah, yeah, it's, it's really easy to forget. Yeah. yeah, so that's why I have it on my desktop, like, do not erase. I love that. And thank <laughs> you for bringing that up because it's so important, I think, when we go through that dark night of the soul or when we're stuck in the, the thick of it, it's so hard to forget, and then oftentimes there's that almost self-criticism piece. I mean, I know I suffer through it. It's like, I thought I did all the work. Why am I back here again? And yeah. yet, when you settle in it, or I find when I settled in it, I was like, oh, wait. And it's different, though, this time. It's like another layer. So it's not the same. It's just, you know, we're given the opportunity to, to bring this back up because there's other pieces we haven't unfolded in that part of that learning, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, something that somebody shared with me once that I found really helpful, and I was telling them, like, I feel like I'm just walking around in circles. Mm-hmm. I feel like I'm just doing this loop. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing over, and, you know, and I'm not actually learning. Mm-hmm. And they said, well, you are walking around and around, mm-hmm. but it's actually a spiral. You yes. just don't see it. Yeah. So you're going to pass the same, like, mm-hmm. checkpoint over and over again, but you're mm-hmm. not the same person. You're growing outwards, outwards, yeah. outwards. And after they told me that, um, I keep trying to come back to that mm-hmm. to, yeah, not to be so, like, self-deprecating mm-hmm. or, yeah, yeah, that, yeah, it's not, it's not, the, it's not the same. It might look the same, but it's not exactly the it's same. not exactly the same. I would say it's like a spiral, but almost like different layers. Mm-hmm. Right? Because you get a different angle or when you approach it, you see it's like, oh, I know this. But then the first time when you did it, you didn't know that. So it's already different. You're already one level you're already viewing it differently already. I dig that. Right? Yeah, because yeah. I was thinking about it as, as 2D, but you brought it into, into yeah. the, yeah, 3D, yeah. 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 Thanks. <laughs> um, so it's really interesting how we met. We met at an event called Mycelium Mysteries, right? Yeah, yes. Mycelial Mysteries. Mycelial, yeah. thank you. And it was so lovely. Some A few things really resonated me, with me, and I was like, oh, I got to have you on the podcast. And there was a couple things, like you started off, like I love it, like you started off singing, before you even started presenting and it's so rare to even see that and I'm can you tell us like share I, I asked you but I would love for you to share again why why you did that oh you know I actually don't even remember that I I don't you I did. don't even remember that you I did, did that you say you know and you have such a lovely voice and I was like oh this is such a lovely way for someone to open and then I remember when I connected with you I was like thank you for singing and then and he's like, oh, it's actually it wasn't really for the group. It was for me oh, okay. to ground myself. And then you shared more because being neurodivergent, sometimes it's really hard to, to ground yourself in a space and, and be focused on what you're sharing because you, 
have so much information you want to share that you get off tan- tangent, right? Mm-hmm. And so I remember that. I was like, oh, that's really lovely. And me being part of my work, I, I do music therapy. So I'm like, yes, yes and yes with the music, right? Like it does ground you and just the frequencies and vibrations. Singing does so much to our bodies and nervous system, right? So I was like, yes, yes, yes. And I understand. And I would love to have you on. And, of course, there's a whole bunch of other things you said. Like another piece that you said that really resonated with me is like how you engage in sensory art right and that's really cool like can you share more about that yeah for sure Mm -hmm. thanks for reminding me because I don't actually remember that I said that but that does make that does make sense so singing feeling the vibrations in different places in my body Mm -hmm. um and that's part of like when I know my vocal training is you Mm -hmm. you you learn how to use the different your different resonators in your body Mm to um create different timbres Mm -hmm. um but actually just feeling it, like especially in, around like around my sternum and my heart space and like my pleural cavity, if I'm vibrating the sound there, mm-hmm. it really helps. But it's also a deep inhale and a mindful release mm-hmm. of that air um, that, yeah, after doing, after doing vocal warm-ups, I usually, I usually feel really, I feel really good. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, it does help to ground me, and I think I don't remember that I said did that or said that. So thank you for <laughs> thank you for uh, for for reminding me of that, mm. of that. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I'm a multi sensory artist. My um official like academic um education, my formal education, is in music. Mm. Um. And I was a performer and a music teacher for about twelve years. Mm. Um. And a few years ago. Um, a few years ago, I had an accident. So I was just walking the dog and I tripped over him and I fell on my hip and I was off my feet for about three months. Mm. Um, I don't know if you know the story of Frida Kahlo, Mm -hmm. um, but there's lots of different parts of, of her story. But one, one part is that she was in a bus accident and, um, um, became disabled as a result. Mm. Um, and she was bedridden for a long time. So she mounted a mirror. Um, above her bed and started painting self-portraits so that's mm-hmm. where like a lot of this and so the her art was part of her healing process mm-hmm. so after I had this accident I'm like well I'm just gonna pull Frida and I started drawing and it was this whole skill set that I forgot I forgot that I had mm-hmm. um and I was like I'm just gonna do one drawing a day so I do one drawing a day and yeah it started off the first thing I drew was a water bottle mm-hmm. and then a shoe mm-hmm. and then I started doing um I started doing portraits of people that I knew. Mm. Um, and then from there, I started um, I started microdosing, actually, as a part of my artistic practice, um, both to connect with, quote-unquote, flow state, but also the way that it affected my vision, even it just so subtly, mm. but it helped me to see patterns mm. uh, and light and shadow a little mm. bit, a little bit better, and I could clearly see how things related to one another I could see the relationships between things Mm -hmm. so now moving to the multi-sensory piece Mm -hmm. um I feel that like art one characteristic of um western European ideology um is about taxonomy is taxonomy so putting things into categories and understanding things by category Mm -hmm. so like in terms of art like this is visual art, this is dance, this is music. So they're all separate things. Very segregated. Yeah, it's yeah. Sacred. And there are mm-hmm. different ways that you approach them. There's different kinds of techniques, but they're all very different rather than looking at the relationship be- between them. Yeah. Um, and as somebody who is neurodivergent, I actually am looking for, like my brain is looking for patterns and mm-hmm. looking for connections constantly. So when you have a form of art that is only based in one particular sense, I would say that everybody has maybe one, maybe two senses that they predominantly lean on to understand the physical world. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you have an art form that's based in only one sense, mm-hmm. the people who identify with that sense mm-hmm. are going to have a very different depth of experience than those who don't. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was thinking about this and, and, and examining this and also thinking too about the ways that I would approach um, teaching music. Because some, you know, I would, I, one of the things... Trust me, this is this is going somewhere. <laughs> um, well, I'm just thinking about one of the students that I had um, at one point was told that he was tone deaf and thought that he was tone deaf. But when I would play a pitch on the piano, I would notice he was actually singing 
either a perfect fourth or a perfect fifth away from mm-hmm. the pitch. So it was just the way that his body was um, understanding. Receiving. Yeah. yeah. So what we did was actually work so that he was putting either putting one hand on um, on my collarbone and one hand on his and trying to match the vibration, or he'd have one hand on the piano mm. and then one hand on his collarbone mm. to match the vibration. But once he started doing that, it was easy. He was singing on pitch. Mm. It wasn't that he wasn't, that he was like quote unquote tone deaf. It's mm. just that the ways that, like the senses that he used to be able to understand mm. what that meant were different. Mm. So I aim to create are experiences that incorporate all of the senses. So there are a multitude of ways of experiencing it and also a multitude of, of things that people can take away with them. So um, I am also, um, so part of my art practice is non-alcoholic cocktail making or cocktail mixology, cocktail bartending. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, um, I have like art. Or zero. <laughs> That's my, my logo on there. Um, and the I the cocktails are actually vehicles for storytelling. Mm. So the different flavors, the different textures, the different colors, the different ingredients are all components of the story that I'm telling. So as I'm mixing the drink, I'm telling the story. So if somebody is like, oh, you know, some so there's the visual aspect. There is the um, like the um, not kinesthetic. What's the word? The touch. <laughs> the, yeah. Touch sensory. aspect, sense, yeah, that, yeah, that aspect of it. There's the olfactory. Mm-hmm. There's like the sound of like you know the shaker. Mm-hmm. Or the, there's it, that in itself is a multisensory thing. So if somebody's really interested in history, or somebody's really interested in like you know the whatever the, the theme. So like I did one theme. I did one pop cocktail program that was Heroes of Stonewall, mm-hmm. and it was all um, each drink was after different aspects of the stories mm-hmm. of the people who were um, uh, integral to the Stonewall uprising mm-hmm. um, in June. Uh, 1969. Mm-hmm. Um, I did another cocktail program that was um, uh, uh, Black Women in Canadian History. So mm-hmm. each drink was, so sometimes the ingredients themselves were things that were from the person's ancestry or the mm-hmm. person's life or, you know, the colors, the different aspects of it. So if people are really interested in history and that kind of thing. Then yeah, there's like a place. For, oh yeah. Sorry. I should also mention that on the actual um, menus themselves, there are QR codes that mm-hmm. can give people more information. Mm-hmm. So yeah, people who like to go on those rabbit holes or something for them. Mm-hmm. People who just want to have like a nice, a nice yeah, 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 a nice cocktail. People who really are interested in like the mixology part of it mm-hmm. or like the visual part of it. There's something, mm-hmm. there's something for, yeah. something for Everyone. everybody. I yeah. love that. It's like anchoring into the senses and experiencing it in its fullest. Mm-hmm. however you engage because everyone has more predominant senses that they engage with more and then also inviting them to to explore the one they might not be as strong doesn't mean it just because it's not as strong doesn't work right mm-hmm. like in your uh, story with that student who who thought he was tone deaf mm-hmm. and I think that's so beautiful like that oftentimes like you're right like this segregation of things um, really we don't even realize we do it subconsciously or unconsciously. Like uh, I was uh, working with a client recently and I, I mentioned like, okay, well there are limitations to confidentiality and at any point, you know, we want to release um, information if you want me to collaborate working with any other practitioners or any professionals that you might not even think of, uh, I welcome that because I want to bring in that holistic approach just because they work with you and within their modalities or sense, senses or engaging you in a sentence in a certain way, I bring in a different element as well. Mm-hmm. And so it's nice to have that bridge and that we're going to work together like more holistically. And they're like, oh, I never thought about that. I've never even had to be asked about that. It's like, yeah, well, then that's where maybe I'll need to get you to sign another form to release consent so that we can work together. And it's like, oh, yeah. I was like, yes. But that's because the more you think of yourself holistically, where everything else is very segregated, yeah. and bringing all that together, it it really shifts how we feel or perceive the world, right? Mm-hmm. And I really love that. And bring tying that piece, I'm fumbling my way through, but tying that piece is like, through this discovery of sensory arts, how has that healed you? Like, because you said you started that journey, and I would love to hear more. Um, or how is that healing you? Because I know this is still an ongoing yeah. journey of yours. It's definitely, it's definitely an ongoing journey. Trust mm-hmm. me, I'm not healed. <laughs> <laughs> so I caught myself in. Like. <laughs> um, so s- attention, sensory attention, or like rooting 
the senses helps to bring us to the now, mm. into the now. Mm -hmm. um, I come from a family culture that um, idol, uh, not idolize, but um, prioritize the intellect mm. um, over the emotional or the physical. That mm -hmm. like, yeah, your intellect was. So as as a result, I find that like, I have been. I think I don't know if it's nature or nurture, but I, I tend to be very cerebral. Cerebral, which, in some ways, is like you know really interesting because I'm, yeah, I, you know thinking about. But it also can lead me away from like from feeling from feeling mm. safe or feeling whole. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's being you know sensory exploration helps to ground me, um, but I'm still learning how to do it. Yeah, I'm really, I'm really still learning, still learning how to do it. I find it's, um, I also have synesthesia, and for folks who don't know what that is, it's a sensory processing, quote unquote, disorder that, um, where you, um, sometimes experience things through more than one sense, so that, like, you know, sometimes, um, sound can, um, be, inter can be interpreted by the brain as color, or, um, taste can be, taste can be shape or texture, you know, that these, that there's, you're experiencing things on multiple levels, which, and I thought that everybody was like that. Mm -hmm. And up until like, you know, maybe 10 years ago, somebody mm -hmm. was mentioning this. I'm like, oh, I thought that was just, I thought that was just quote unquote normal. Um, and that's where I find that like, um, yeah, through my art practice, that's when things like that become, become a superpower. Mm. Um, uh, yeah. Um, a lot of the pieces that I work on, um, I'm either consciously or subconsciously processing something. Mm -hmm. um, part of how I approach my art making is just to try to be, just to show up willingly, mm -hmm. or like you know when, like kind of like in yoga where it's you know you show you on yourself sort of showing up on the mat. That's kind of what I, I try to do: just show up and be open, and then allow whatever to come out come out mm -hmm. but at the end of the piece it's very clear what I was trying to process mm -hmm. but it's not I don't necessarily have an intention mm -hmm. um, going into it so I have this one piece where um, it's a sculpture it's a it's a, a plaster like a plaster cast of my body mm -hmm. and after it was finished I realized that it really was about my um, sacral chakra mm -hmm. and healing my sacral chakra mm -hmm. there's like a lot of um, um, words that came out about, about, um, about creativity and about safety and about, um, honoring, honoring myself and mm -hmm. like lots of oranges and things like mm -hmm. that, that came, came out through it. Um, the works that the body of work that I've been working on this for a while, um, it, it looks at three ancestors of the African diaspora. Mm -hmm. So one from continental Africa, one from the Caribbean and one from Turtle Island. Um, and it explores through these, I chose these three particular people, um, as people who have displayed exemplary, um, leadership qualities, but leadership as stewardship and liberation mm -hmm. to juxtapose the current paradigm that we're living under mm -hmm. of ownership and domination. Mm -hmm. And through the examples of these three people, mm -hmm. It shows that like there is another there is another way to lead, but even from piece to piece, as I'm like showing up to the canvas and um, you know I try to open myself up and ask them ask them for guidance like uh, the, the guidance of the person who I'm who I'm painting, mm -hmm. um, and just whatever comes out comes out. But I remember like the first one that I worked on, there were times when I was just like bawling mm -hmm. as I was as I was working. Uh, yeah, oh, as I was as I was working on it, um, it was very very cathartic and um, yeah. I hope that answered the yeah. Yeah, answered the question. And I'm hearing because um, one part that I, I I kind of resonated with is that you're like I, there was an intention, and I'm like as I'm hearing you share, it's like you did have an intention. Your intention was to be open to the process. To see what, to be open to listen, to be open to be present, to see what whoever you're painting wants to convey and share with you, and or 
to to allow these emotions to flow. So there was that intention. What I was really hearing is um, there wasn't an attachment to the outcome or the end end yes. of the process, right? And I think that so mirrors how we journey through life and how we heal and grow. That's part of growth. It's not to attach to the end goal and outcome, but to be open and to set the intention of allowing things to flow or your intentions to, like, okay, I'm going to maybe work on my body, like, with the energy. But that's an intention, but it's not the outcome of, like, what is it going to be like exactly, right? And so that's what I'm hearing. And it's really important to remember that. It's like there is an intention, but not attaching to the outcome. Thank you for bringing it up because attachment to outcome was actually is a much more accurate mm -hmm. description of what I, what I meant to say. Mm -hmm. But words are really powerful, so the yes. fact that I said that and um, that you like guided me back to that, I appreciate that. Yeah, thanks. I was listening. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the other part, like I know you mentioned, you microdose, um, and part of that event, and another thing that you shared that really spoke to me. And I was like, oh, it got me really curious as well. You mentioned that it's like, you know, there's that stigma or even that judgmental piece where when people recreationally uh, partake in psilocybin or mushrooms, magic mushrooms or psychedelics, it's like frowned upon. And yet you mentioned it's like, well, you know, no, there's also healing from that process as well. Um, I would love for you to share more because that also yeah. resonated because it's so easy to judge, right? And now that... I think it's really important to bring that up because now that we're there's this like new renewed interest and there are all these studies coming up and stuff, I want people to understand that yeah, I mean there's a space and time for everything and just because we do it differently doesn't mean it's always bad or good. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. I don't wanna hang out with anybody who thinks recreation is bad. They sound like a really boring person. <laughs> But no, I under, I under, I understand I understand what what you're what to, what, what you mean. Yeah, they, there is definitely like there seems to be this idea that um, somehow recreation or are um, experiencing different states of consciousness in a recreational way is somehow not medicine. Mm -hmm. Joy that comes from recreation that's medicine. Like mm -hmm. you know, if we're not living for joy then what are we what are we living for um i my first introduction to quote-unquote psychedelics was through the rave scene i was a like 90s warehouse mm -hmm. warehouse party raver kid and um those are some of my first in introductions that being said that's not how i choose to the kinds of environments i typically choose to um to experience psychedelics anymore because it's just it's not it's just not where i am right now but um yeah, like that. Those years of being, especially when I was when I was younger, being um, immersed in that culture and, and like in the in that counterculture, were so formative and so healing. And a lot of folks that I knew too who were drawn to that who were drawn to that scene were people who, in other pieces of their life, were outcast. Mm -hmm. um, lots of queer folks, mm -hmm. lots of um, folks with disabilities, lots of folks who, yeah, were you know. For whatever reason, felt that like they were not felt felt like they were experiencing that were experiencing marginalization in in the outside world and didn't you know fit into like didn't conform to mainstream quote unquote norms. Mm -hmm. Found a home and found a place of acceptance and love mm -hmm. within that scene. And to me, that was like that is that is very very healing. Mm -hmm. um, yes, of course, you know there you know there's a dark side of stuff too. And I'm not saying that like, it's this perfect utopia and, um, yeah, there are definite things that I'm sort of surprised that I came out. Okay. <laughs> at the end, because, um, yeah, you know, there's, you know, there's a bigger conversation also to be had around, um, risk reduction and harm reduction, mm -hmm. informed consent, mm -hmm. um, understanding like drug safety, these kinds of things. So I'm not trying to say like, everybody go out and do all the drugs. Like, you know, every, you know, and, and just, I'm just, Saying that, like, there, you know, it doesn't have. You don't have to experience these different states of awareness, consciousness, understanding within, like, a clinical environment in order for them to be 
to be beneficial. Yeah. 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 And like everything, I, that's such a great point. Point. So, so thank you so much, Naomi. Like, a, like anything in life, or like let's use the medical system because most people are familiar with it. Doctor will prescribe you prescription, or even supplements. You can take it, and and it can do some good, or sometimes it can do more harm if you don't have the proper information or know how to do it, right? Mm -hmm. And it depends on how you use it, right? And depends on the intention, like those spaces recreationally, feeling that joy, that connection with others, that's healing, Mm -hmm. right? And so it's like, what is the intention behind the use? But then here it gets a little bit, you know, gray because... You don't know what you don't know. So oftentimes, yeah. like even in the medical system, you don't know what to ask. So it's like learning about how to ask the right question, educating yourself before you dive into something without knowing. Like, don't trust someone just because they say it works for them because, yeah, it probably did work for them, but it might not be the same for you because you bring in with different things. You have different life experiences, right? Yeah. So it's just... Take everything everyone says with a grain of salt and do your own research. Yeah. Right? And even with the research that you do, there are so many factors that can affect your experience. Exactly. Yeah, like whatever if you ate for breakfast that mm-hmm. day or if you had, you know, the kind of conversation you had with mm-hmm. your partner before. You know, like everything is going to affect the way that you, you know, that you engage with yeah. the world around you mm-hmm. and, um, and the world within you as mm-hmm. well. Um, there is this um, herbalist and um, food sovereignty activist um that whose work i whose work i follow an author whose work i follow her name is kukua Aba, um and she yeah educates a lot she's very well versed in in herbs and this one video that i was watching of her uh she said just that she was talking uh, the person who was interviewing her is like oh is this good for you and she said well just as something has the power to heal you it has the same power to harm you yes and that's with everything. Everything has, you know, everything has two sides. Like, the more powerful it can go, like, one way it can mm-hmm. be that way in, like, you know, in a number of different, like, you know, mm-hmm. infinite different possibilities mm-hmm. have that same kind of power. So, yeah, all these things are to be, yeah. I was just speaking about my about my own experience, but, you know, there's, yeah. I just, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm also drawing from my own perspective and experiences, like, coming into this world and working like with psychedelics and being new to it uh, coming from a cultural background it's like and uh have being brought up in a very dogmatic religious background as well it's just like no this is all bad it's gonna kill you and there's a lot of misinformation as well as what i've discovered as i learned more about this mm-hmm. and uh, you know like just to give you an instance it's like i thought drugs were worse than alcohol but if you look on a toxicity chart Actually, a lot of the classic psychedelics, uh, like psilocybin mushrooms or um, MDMA or LSD, they're actually very low on the toxicity level compared to alcohol. Mm-hmm. Like alcohol is like way more harmful, and 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 but you don't think of that that way because that's what I was brought up in, and then bring in shame and guilt and religion and all, and cultural aspects. I I was one of those people that judged and I was like, ooh, recreational, bad. bad. And, and how I was introduced to that was more through therapy. And then I, I recognized as I was interacting with different people from different backgrounds, I was like, oh, wait, this is triggering, not triggering, but not the right word. This is bringing up a piece where I'm, like, noticing that I'm judging. And I'm like, wait, I don't, is it, I'm judging is because I don't understand or judging because, you know, is it based on my own personal background experiences and perceptions? And then I realized, wait, how can I so judge easily when I don't even know what that's like, mm-hmm. right? And so I was like, just because I was exposed to this, this is not just the only way. Like you mentioned, there's so many variable factors. So I decided at one point I'm going to try recreationally with a group of people that I trusted and feel safe with. I've also tried it with a group that I didn't know because I was like, I'm just going to say, and I was like, ooh, not a good experience. And, and that taught me, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I didn't take a huge dose, but I took enough so that I could feel it. And then with the, the different environments, I noticed, like, recreationally, it was healing. It allowed me to open up more in instances where I learned to shut myself off because I wanted to protect myself from being vulnerable, and I wasn't letting them in. Mm-hmm. But I was able to make these beautiful connections and authentically sh- allow myself to show up where normally I wouldn't. Yeah. Right? And so, yeah, I, that's why I really love how... You, shared that and that really resonated with that piece and I just wanted to share that just to 
invite people to to think and explore. Yeah, I think it's also a complex com- conversation because addiction is a thing. Yeah, and mm. um, abusive relationships with with, with substances yes. is, a a is a thing. Yeah, so I'm not trying to like gloss no. to gloss over that mm-hmm. at all in any way. I think that also not every medicine is for everybody. And that's one of the things I think that's like not that doesn't always come into a part of the conversation, especially when we're talking about like things that things that will heal you. Well, not everybody is gonna have the same um, response mm-hmm. to, you know, um, yeah. Yeah, so I'm not, I'm not advocating or shunning it. I'm just sharing my, my experience, mm-hmm. part of my experience, mm-hmm. um, and yeah, I think that ideas of um, how sometimes it can negatively impact your mental health, yeah. um, and how, um, yeah, yeah, trying to see these complex medicines as like putting them as like saying this is good and this is bad is really is yeah because yeah not every not everything is not everything is for everybody no it isn't yeah right? and then just because it worked for someone else doesn't mean it will show up for you the same way right yeah. and and i think we were conversing earlier even about microdosing was like everyone's like now like hearing about microdosing is helpful it's useful and then i've had people say tell me uh, it's like I tried it it's not for me I actually felt more anxious or I felt like it can bring up more things mm-hmm. and if you don't have the tools it's like or it's like I've tried it and it's allowed me to feel more but then I don't know what to do so I felt even more overwhelmed and it felt worse yeah and that actually was my experience um with microdosing with um with um psilocybin mushrooms mm-hmm. and I've had a relationship with mushrooms since like, for a really long time mm-hmm. um and yeah I thought okay I'm going to see about working with them as, like, microdosing as an antidepressant. Mm -hmm. And at first, actually, it was great. It was, like, it helped, they helped me to sit, to observe my emotions Mm -hmm. rather than feeling, like, I identified with them, Mm -hmm. which was really, really helpful. Mm -hmm. Um, But it also brought up anxiety. Or sometimes if I didn't, if I did, if I forgot that I had, because it's just playing in the background, so sometimes you even just forget that you've Mm -hmm. taken it, Mm -hmm. that things just seem... And I'm a person, like, I'm a highly sensitive person anyway who feels things really deeply, mm-hmm. and it would just amplify yes. amplify that, whatever it is. But if I've forgotten that I've, if it's anxiety, mm-hmm. it makes it so bad. I remember one time calling calling a friend being like, yeah, I'm, like, totally having an anxiety attack mm-hmm. after taking, you know, I was, I don't think it was, like, 250 milligrams. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he sat, sat with me on the phone while I, while I, like, walked around the block, and it just helped to, to calm me down. And, yeah, um... So that's just what you do to be to be, to be aware, aware of too. Yeah, it's not like you know it's gonna just make everything great and take yeah. your you know it's it's just whatever you are feeling. Or well, my experience, I should speak from my experience. My experience with microdosing with mushrooms is that whatever I'm feeling, it just becomes really present. Yes, and that's what psychedelics does. It drops you to be more embodied and present because we spend so much of our lives being so distracted by different things. Mm-hmm. We're taught not to be present, to dissociate, to avoid, or to breathe, whichever it is. And it's just teaching you to actually know you're present. And that's part of that healing and growth process. It's like, how do we be pre- present with these feelings and emotions? But then if you don't know how to, yeah. that's really scary, right? And so it's like, n- there's no right or wrong. It's just learning and maybe getting support as well. It's like how you called your friend, yeah. right? It's, we're not supposed to do all this alone. And, and, and it's just being cautious when you do this. It's not because you're doing it wrong. It's just maybe you don't know how to and you, you haven't been taught how to process it with emotions. Maybe you're feeling more for the first time. Yeah. It's like, what do you do? Because it can be overwhelming, right? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, as, and as I, I mentioned, like, yeah, I'm somebody who already, like, my, my emotions are, like, it, intense as it mm. is. Um, but the flip side of the anxiety thing is if I've forgotten that I've taken them and I walk outside, I'm like, wow, the sky is just so beautiful mm-hmm. today and, like, all the plants mm-hmm. look so healthy and blah, mm-hmm. why is everything, oh, yeah, I forgot I microdosed. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it can work, yeah, it can. It can work either it way. Can. And it's just yeah. learning these tools and learning yourself. That's part of the healing, learning yourself and yeah. learning how to navigate feeling or being more appreciative. Like, that's part of being present. Uh, a wonderful teacher once taught me and, they, they said that 
you know, as you learn to unfold and peel back this onion, which is yourself, um, it's you learn to tune in more and be more embodied. But it's an inconvenient gift because you don't get to pick and choose. <laughs> yeah. You just can feel more of everything, which can be not the great stuff, more overwhelm, anxiety, or anxiousness, or it could be grief or sadness, whatever is present that you've been avoiding, right? Mm -hmm. But then it can also allow you to be more present to things that are beautiful around you that you forget because you're not being present, right? Mm -hmm. So you can bring up those beautiful things. And again, speaking from my personal self, I, I there's so many different ways of microdosing. And um, from my own personal experience, it's that inconvenient gift. It is like, oh, yes, I'm feeling more. Yeah. Now, how do I navigate this? Or I'm appreciating more. How, how can I remember this so I can bring myself to... To, to these moments again, right? Mm -hmm. and, and then, like, there's so many different substances and stuff, and, like, even when I'm microdosing DMT, um, I do find, and when I say microdose, I don't even mean, like, it's, when you're microdosing, you should feel nothing. <laughs> Maybe just a little bit more clarity, right? And then being sensitive. I'm very sensitive. So even, like, with psilocybin, just for a gauge, mm -hmm. when I'm microdosing, for me, a microdose is, like, 25 milligrams or 50 Everyone's a little different, but that's when it's more, things are a little bit maybe more clear, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't feel anything else. I don't see things. It's just like, ah. Um, and if I take, like, say, 100, it's like, like, I can perceptually feel a big difference already. It's like, it's, it's for me, it's no longer a microdose. And I find that with microdosing DMT, where you, sh you don't feel anything, the only thing I sense is that it's like a grounding effect, which is very lovely. Oftentimes when we get so swept up in our emotions or overwhelm or the daily grind or whatever triggered us without even us knowing, it's just nice to have that groundedness. But then what the more I experience and explore this and do my own journey, and I don't know if it's true for you, um, it's discovering other ways to, to get to those those presentness. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if that's a word, but it's like the psychedelics can show you how to be more present, to be more embodied. And it's, and it's like, here's the key. We have this, we can do this. But how do we do that without it, right? And, mm -hmm. and for you, I'm hearing like through sensory arts, right? That's one of the processes. Yeah. For, for me, it's like through movement or breath work and dance, right? And there's so many different modalities. And, and I find that it's like, here's the key, now explore, mm -hmm. right? Without having to always default to that, right? I think, too, another part that I really want to bring into this conversation is, and just for, like, kind of context about, like, where I'm at in, at in this part mm -hmm. of my life, like, the main medicines that I work with mm -hmm. are, like, plant, like whole mm -hmm. plant and fungi beings. But the beings, that's, they are sentient, mm -hmm. wise mm -hmm. beings that we are. And bringing something into your body is, like, that, like, eating is... Ingesting is one of the most intimate acts mm -hmm. that you can, you know, you're literally um, like merging mm -hmm. to beings. Mm -hmm. So understanding this, that they have, like they're, yeah, they're wise, sentient teachers mm -hmm. that are ancient, that um, they're not like, they're not, they're not substances. They are teachers to learn from. So all these things that, you know, that you're, op you, you have, I think there's a certain amount of respect that is needed when approaching them and also setting that intention, talking to these beings, understanding that these beings are here to, yeah, to show you what you need, what you need to see and having, like, building a trusting open relationship, or being, building a trusting and respectful relationship mm -hmm. is where the real healing is going to happen. Because if you think that when you are making something a part of your body that you're separate from it, yeah. Yeah. that's like, that's, I mean, at, there, at, at no point are we separate from anything else yes. around us. But, I mean, like, especially in that moment that, like, oh, this is me and this is the, like, no, like, you're, you know, they're emerging together. But that being is wiser than yeah. our than our egos. Exactly. And I thank you for bringing that up, that they're teachers, whether they're actual organic, live, living beings. But I think everything has its own frequency. And if you tune in, like a music note, it teaches you something if you listen. Tune in, like every note, even part of a symphony. Some people is like, oh, it's just so small, it's so insignificant. It's like, oh, it's not though. If you take that note away, the piece 
no longer the same. Mm -hmm. So it's like learning to tune into those frequencies, whether it's organic or inorganic. They all have something to teach us if we tune in, mm -hmm. if we listen. And I really like that. I appreciate that. Thank you for that reminder. Yeah. Art is much the same. It's interesting. I was talking to a friend of mine who they're uh, about they're about to release an album and mm -hmm. that they've been working on for a number of years. Mm -hmm. and, talking to them on the phone a little while ago they said yeah i'm kind of going through this grief process and i'm like that makes sense essentially you've been like gestating this baby that you're about to birth into the world and yeah art itself like back to that whole idea of intention and attachment mm. to outcome mm -hmm. um yeah you're just being there to nurture the growth and development of this being that is going to like take form and take shape and then you like you know you let it go mm -hmm. into the world the same as like you know having a baby well yeah. not exactly the same but you understand you understand what there's I mean. there's still a grieving process yeah and I, I like how you brought that up because i find that as we grow and as we heal and continue to grow there's different cycles we go through and oftentimes people don't even bring this up it's like how about grieving who we were or, mm -hmm. or who our identities we attached to for so long and now we shifted to some some different variation of us as we continue our own journey and how often are we even thinking about that grief and loss of who we were compared to who we are now in this moment mm -hmm. and what's that like for you interesting that you bring that up <laughs> um I'm just going to share something very personal. Um, my New Year's, I make New Year's intentions, not New Year's resolutions. I mean, New Year, like, resolutions are, like, yes and no, very, like, you Again, know, hard line. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, but my intention this year was to achieve less mm. and grieve more. Mm. So it was this, you know, the there is this idea that I'm trying to let go of that, and I think that like, a lot of people living under capitalism have this same thing that what we produce or what we do or like this persona or like, yeah, like our, our productivity is um, a measure of our, of our self-worth. Not only that, but the accolades that we get for our, producti our, our productivity mm -hmm. are also like confirmation. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel like the pursuit of that can be like, it's never, it's never ending. It's like, it, you know, it, yeah, it's, it's. There is, there is no end, there is no end, end goal. So it's just this this like running on a hamster wheel. So, and I feel like there's a lot of things that I hadn't been not. I feel like I know that there are a lot of things that I have been holding on to for a really long time that I haven't been able to let go of. So that that was my New Year's my, my New Year's intention this year is achieve less mm. and grieve more. And that's been am I allowed to swear? On, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's yeah. been really fucking hard. It is fucking hard. That kind of oh. work. That kind of work is hard. It is hard. And the moment I made that intention, I don't think I knew what I was getting myself into. <laughs> Here's the thing: when you say intentions, <laughs> you have to be very, very specific because if not, then the universe will answer. Yeah. And it will give you what you need, not always how you want it. Yeah. It's been hard, but I don't think that's a bad thing. I think mm -hmm. it's something I definitely needed needed to mm -hmm. do, but I don't. I think that. I, I don't know what my expectate. I didn't I didn't know what to expect, but it also have, has really like shown me that I haven't been taught how to grieve. Oh. And I don't and I'm looking around at like patterns in um in our society, yes. um like in dysfunctional within like dysfunctional systems, whether it's family systems, government systems, social mm -hmm. systems, that yeah, people generally don't know how to grieve. And there isn't one right, right way to, there is not one right way to grieve. And the way that grief has shown up for me is that it's not the same every time either. It isn't. So, um, yeah, going through these, well, I was, first I was going to say this process, but I'm actually going to correct myself. These processes that just keep like, seem to, you know, more and more and more things keep, keep coming up. Um, it's been really humbling um, to, and I feel like lost at sometimes and not really knowing how to hold myself through, um, yeah, through these processes and they can get really, really, really overwhelming. Mm -hmm. But what my hope is at the, I don't want to say at the end of it, but once I'm, you know, like we're always in the state of becoming. So as I'm like in this state of becoming, 
that I, rather than like stopping grieving that, or finishing grieving, that I understand how to hold that with a bit more gentleness within myself. Mm. So I'm hearing in those moments when it gets really hard, it's learning to bring in gentleness and, and to actually flow through it instead of stopping it and resisting it. Yeah. yeah. The flowing through, but also just like the radical acceptance uh, of the ugly parts, like the ugly parts where you're like on all fours, just like bawling. And I don't know if maybe, maybe this is a TMI, but sometimes I get like, I just feel like I just need to have a really good cry. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there's nobody else around, but it's ugly. And like the nose is running, and like, ah, like deep guttural sobs. Like I'm trying to like push this stuff, push this stuff out, and mm -hmm. like, yeah, learning how to just be present. Be present with it. Yeah. Yeah. Like if it was a little kid, I wouldn't say, "Oh, look at you, you're disgusting." <laughs> like you know, what like what are you doing? But I find myself saying these things to these things to myself. So I think the real learning is to be able to observe how I can let go of the old patterns too that are keeping me in those in those places. But it's, yeah, it's a process. Mushrooms have really been great allies in this, in this process of, mm. of trying to. So one of the things that I find that they help me with, like I, I know I touched on this earlier, is that like I, I'm not suppressing the natural cycle of things, but it helps you to be able to like be actually fully present in it mm -hmm. and complete the cycle, mm -hmm. but not identify with the emotions, but just understand that like, this is just something that that's, this is something that's happening right now. Mm -hmm. So we'll just let it mm -hmm. complete itself rather than trying to, yeah, push it down, which. Well, that's um, where it gets stuck. Yeah. Right. In the, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious. Um, and if you can share with our listeners from your own experience, uh, I know being neurodivergent and having you know these experiences, or even using mushrooms because you you have a relationship with it. How has it helped you, or how has it maybe not helped you? I don't know, right? Yeah. Um, you mean the combination of neurodivergence and my relationship with mushrooms? Mm -hmm. I don't know because I don't know any. I don't know any other way of being, and it's kind of interesting that you bring it up because this whole. Um, identity <laughs> there were I mean it was like four years ago I was chatting with a friend and you know, we've been friends for like 20 some odd years mm. we've been friends for a long time mm. and you know, I was talking to her and she's like oh yeah it has you know you know because you're autistic and blah 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 and I'm like what she says oh I just thought you were mm. and I said oh, she's, oh well, no, no offense I'm like no I don't I, I don't take offense to that I just don't even really know what that means and when I started and prior to that I've always felt like have you seen that movie, The Truman Show? Yes. Okay, I felt like, that was one of the movies I really related to, because mm -hmm. I always felt like Truman, like, mm -hmm. there's, everybody knows something that I don't, or mm -hmm. that there's, like, there's this, that somehow, like, I just knew that, I felt alien, and I knew mm -hmm. that I was different, but I didn't really understand why. I knew that, like, a lot of it was, my life was trying to decode Stuff, it's like playing a board game mm. where all the where all the like the game square pieces are moving around mm. and everybody else knows that they're going to but I'm still just trying to like figure out like how to move my thing to the next piece and then there were other areas of my life where things would be super obvious and I didn't understand why nobody else could see them or like yeah um, so anyways when I was able to start framing it as like autism or neurodivergence, all like that reframing my life story with that new framework, all these lights started turning on mm -hmm. and all these things started making sense as to like why I was feeling the way I was feeling mm -hmm. rather than just feeling like I'm inherently fucked up mm -hmm. and not knowing why, that I'm inherently different than it. Like I'm inherently like not like wrong or bad or, and so this understanding, like me, it's like meeting myself for the first time. I know that sounds so cliche, but that's really that's really what it's what it's been like. So I'm still going through that process mm -hmm. of understanding like what this means and connecting with like other um, connecting with other autistic adults mm -hmm. and um, being able to 
have these open relationships uh, or uh, open interactions where I don't, where I'm not trying to like fit into like the norm of the, of the group that I feel, you know, I don't know if, I'm, if, if that makes sense, but being able to like show up as I am in my authenticity, mm. um, has been a healing process, but it's an on, it's an ongoing process and grief comes into that too, because part of it is grieving, not really grieving my old self because I've always been this person, but more like grieving the old perceptions yes. of myself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And stepping into this new understanding of self mm-hmm. and a big part of that too is under is learning about um how i need to take care of myself mm-hmm. because the way like you know being divergent mm-hmm. in any kind of way it mm-hmm. means that your way of being is not the norm mm-hmm. which means that your way of caring for yourself also needs to be different than the norm so mm-hmm. learning about that like you know certain dietary things mm-hmm. and like how much rest i need and like Oh, you know, the, yeah, these, all, all, all these kinds of things, understanding, like, um, and, and we were talking about this earlier before we started recording, but now learning that, um, yeah, about managing, managing my, my time and understanding. I've also been going through, um, some processes that now have make me have to like approach, mm-hmm. um, workload differently. Mm-hmm. So things that used to be like, super, super easy. Um, now I have to like, or maybe, maybe take me three times as longer, or I have to like find different kinds of ways to approach them. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's been, that's been super humbling. So your, but your question was about, um, about, uh, my relationship with, Mm -hmm. uh, with mushrooms. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't, I, I can't really speak to that because I only know my own relationship Mm -hmm. with mushrooms and they've, it's, that hasn't really changed Mm -hmm. the only I mean they've always been teachers that have shown me what I need to see and process Mm -hmm. at that moment even when I was thinking that I was neurotypical they were still Mm -hmm. they were still doing that Mm -hmm. yeah thank you very yeah it's I like how you drew back into like they're teachers and whether typical or or neurodivergent, it doesn't matter, it's just teachers, and I think that's part of the process, is learning to, again, be open, good or bad, and being open to actually lean in, and presently, like, what are you trying to teach me, what am I here to learn, right, and it's so easy to default to, like, this feels uncomfortable, how do I move past from this discomfort, right, and that's our natural, what we've, most of the time, been taught to, to protect ourselves, right, it's like, yeah. we feel discomfort, and and so I want to bring in that piece if it's all right. It's like, here's the tricky thing, though. Like, when we're trying new things or this new discovery is like, what? Now it's taking me three times longer than it used to. For, it's like learning this acceptance. It's like, wait, this is what I need right now. Yeah. And being okay with that acceptance piece and then learning to be like, this is what it's trying to teach me right now. Because we are not always going to be the same. We're never the same. Even, like, when I... When, like, as a therapist, when I see clients, I, they'll tell me all this, and, and it's like, yes. And when you come in next week, I'm going to tune in and check and see what's up. Because even from in, let alone, like, a day, a week, or an hour from now, things can shift. And mm-hmm. things will be different. So it's learning to just how to tune in more presently and honor what's showing up and, and seeing what those teachers are saying in those moments, whether it's through medicine or through what emotions are coming up for us, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think another thing is um, under dominant culture, Mm -hmm. I'm somebody who um, lives on a number of different intersecting identities Mm -hmm. Um, as a queer person, Mm -hmm. as a black person, Mm -hmm. as a woman, Mm -hmm. um, as a person with disabilities, Mm -hmm. you know, um, a number of different, um, yeah, number of different things. And um, understanding that the world, not, I shouldn't say the world, this society that I live under is not meant for me to thrive. It's not designed for me to thrive. So working with, I trust mushrooms implicitly because they don't lie to me. Mm. They're brutally, no, not, not brutally, they're radically honest. Mm. Um, and rather than trying to, I'm learning about myself again. Um, I'm 
starting to that like I'm actually learning about myself rather than trying to make myself into what I think that I'm supposed to be. But part of that means also trying to find like create new systems that are not or find find ways to survive or find ways of being that are outside of what of, out of what's prescribed like seeking out therapy for example that is that has been a big challenge for me because I know the way my brain works talk therapy does not does not work for me mm-hmm. and I think that there's like you know there's a big like, you know go to therapy like you, you see that I see that all, all the time like on on on, Inst- on Instagram social media it's like oh therapy 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 but a lot of therapy modalities are not meant for neurodivergent people and they're also and what is considered norm like the the norms as outlined in the dsm-5 like a lot of the or the the, the dsm so i'm trying to think of the what is the statistical manual what what is the what is the the diagnostic yeah. statistical yeah. manual is that what it's called so like the bible of mental of yeah, mental illness five. yeah <laughs> um just in case somebody doesn't know what the, I just, I, it irks me when people speak in acronyms and don't explain them. So yeah. So like the, the book that outlines a bunch of mental health Mm -hmm. conditions or mental disorders Mm -hmm. that has been the research for the majority of those things have been done uh, um, either by white men or for white men or both. Mm -hmm. A lot of the study groups are like, it's a very Eurocentric. So it's basically like what is considered, um, what is considered normal by one um, cultural standard, and then if you di- if you are divergent from that norm, then it's a it's a disorder, and there's and there is something wrong with you. So for a field of study where that's kind of like the basis of approaching, that obviously is not going to work for me because I'm like none of the, none of those none of those things. So it's um, I'm not saying that like you know for for some people like talk therapy is super super helpful and it's really but for me and I've tried and I've tried and I've tried I've never found it helpful but I've also found that there are other forms of therapeutic practice that I can incorporate into my life that are helpful it's just not in the talk therapy and that's the discovering so oftentimes when people say seek therapy it doesn't just mean I mean oftentimes what media and and television and social media portrays as talk therapy not just talk therapy and healing modalities and integrating like and learning these tools and how to apply and practice because it's all part of practice and I'll expand a little bit more on that after is is discovering how you work because we all work a little differently there may be some norms quote unquote but what is norm mm-hmm. right and then and then depends on the systems you were brought in and then the, there's so many variable factors it can be all these layers as you mentioned is really learning to be more present with yourself and discovering what works for you. Like, I guess, more simplistically, simply put, drawing back from your first example, the um, music example where you're teaching this boy about, you're not tone deaf. It's like discovering what senses that you engage more in and connect with that really speaks and resonates with you to allow you to understand, mm-hmm. right? And so there, that... Thank goodness there's a lot of different modalities and that's part of the exploring. Yeah. Right? And so, like how there's all these different types of plant medicines or supplements. It's like, again, learning to discover just because it's good for you doesn't mean it is good for you or you, it can also create harm. So it's just learning what your needs are and, and really tuning in, right? Right. And I think the mic, uh, like going back to that bit of like awareness is like, but that's part of the discovery. Yeah. Yeah, and like the question, like what, what, what is normal? So like you know, on one level, on like a universal level, like yes, of course we know that there is no like you know, there is no normal because everything is constantly in a state of becoming, and everything is you know that's just that's how you know we're constantly in a state of, of becoming. But in like when we're talking about living in this society, mm-hmm. what is normal? Normal li- living in a uh, a supremacist like with, within a supremacist framework, meaning that you're thinking that like, you know, hierarchical, that then normal is dictated by the people at the top. At the top. Yes. So that is also a reality that I think that, and as much as we want to say like we're above it, we're not, we're, we're impacted by it. In every Just because we, yeah, we, nobody's an island, right? We, no. we, we interact with one another. So in this society, what is normal dictates access to ther- access to different therapeutic yes. models access to um, um, culturally appropriate 
models of um, a, a healing, a culturally appropriate healing modalities. It impacts the ways that um, we are regarded or we, that others, inter others interact with us, whether that is a, co a conscious or a subconscious thing living under this dominant culture, we're all influenced by it. And yeah, again, it's kind of like when people say, oh, we're, we're, we're all one. And like, you know, I don't, you know, I don't see color or whatever. Like, okay, yes, uh, universal spiritual principles. That's absolutely true. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to argue with you at all. That's a hundred percent true. We are all one, mm -hmm. but <laughs> that doesn't mean that in the system, the, in the system that we're in yeah. that oper operates that yes. way. So I think that it's important to be able to hold both things as true yes. um, and not to try to cancel one out with It's not with about cancel. I think it's about really understanding and being aware because yeah. then like how you were sharing, being aware helps you learn to navigate and create things that work for you that are outside of the system mm -hmm. or recognizing this is not meeting me where I'm at. And then this brings in the vulnerability piece we were talking about earlier in different conversations is like, just because this modality is good, so say psych psychedelics, it leaves you up more open and vulnerable. But if you don't have the support because of the system that if you're, say, um, you're at a different economic status or you're a different, uh, like, you're, you have all these layers of, like, you're a minority and this, you're a woman, or there's more vulnerabilities. If you don't understand those pieces, just because this modality is great, doesn't mean it could be useful for you because it give you it opens you up without having those support systems around you after. Yeah, and the support right. systems and the integration piece with any kind of healing, like if you go and get gallbladder surgery <laughs> and you come out of the hospital, like you're gonna hope that somebody's gonna be there to like, you know, help, you yeah, help, help take help take yeah. care of you while you're like learn, you know, while mm -hmm. you're in the healing process, mm -hmm. you know, like, no, we don't live we don't live in a silo, but like these. Not but we don't live in a we don't live in a silo. Yeah. We're not completely like mm -hmm. you know independent individuals. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, with the inter, you know integrate a lot of these back to this whole idea of ta taxonomy and putting mm -hmm. things into categories. A lot of these so the, a lot of these identities are a result of what has been fed to us as the norm, mm -hmm. not that the norm is created based on these identities mm -hmm. and I think that's an important piece to bring it to to bring to bring into the discussion too but it is going to impact access mm -hmm. yeah access to access to certain things and even like you know there's like physical access or economic access but I just even mean like places of com like being able to be held with with compassion and to be able to have your truth held as as valid mm -hmm. or equally important as everybody else's and safe and safe and yeah safe and feeling that safe because like you do all this work but then if you you're in the system environment doesn't provide you that safety it's just like becomes even scarier because now you're processing and bringing up all this emotions but there's now nowhere to safely integrate them right mm -hmm. and so I, I remember you bringing that piece up and it's like even you mentioning and after we talked, I was like, huh, you are right. Like, I, I've lived in Vancouver a while, and it, and I, I just didn't think of it. I, I don't know why. I'm in shock. It was like, I've lived in other cities and other countries, and, like, even the black culture in Vancouver is, like, not very, like, strong compared to other places that I've been in. And, and then bringing in, like, even those different social circles, like, adding in the component, like, if you're a minority um, living with disabilities and a woman, it just adds more and more of these layers that makes it really more hard, right? And complex, yeah. yeah. I just want to challenge on the, what, how you framed um, saying that the black culture here is not strong. Mm. Um, I disagree. Okay. I see there is a lot of that the West Coast has this, like, of, like so called Canada tends to see itself as more progressive, mm. but there is deep-seated anti-blackness that exists. And I live in a number of different places in Canada, and I've seen it more here than, like, out. And I'm from Vancouver. I'm born here. Mm. More so than, than a lot of places. Mm. So people are intentionally segregated and intentionally pushed out. Mm. 
their the spaces are not welcoming. Mm-hmm. So yeah, there are there's 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 black people here. Like there are people who we gather, we do things. You know, like there's not like you know, but many in many spaces we are not allowed access, or we are not we're not there's they're not spaces that mm-hmm. that are. I think that's that, what I yeah. meant because compared to other cities like say Toronto, the community like it's just like there's more of that. Uh, I don't know how to frame this. More that presence of like oh yeah oh yeah there's this community I see see it and we experience it more but we're here I guess like you said there's it's so segregated and so yeah just but, but again like this I just want to say like kind of like what we were talking about before about identities being um, a result of power structures mm-hmm. rather than power structures being a result of the identities mm-hmm. that saying oh it's segregated isn't just by accident, it's because many of these spaces mm-hmm. are deliberately pushing black people out and not, and deli- deliberately. For example, West, uh, I think it's West Point Gray. Yeah, um, my, I'm trying to think, for a very long time up until recently, and somebody told me that it's still on the book, I don't know if it is, but there's actually, like there's it written in law that black people cannot buy property, that are not allowed to buy property there. Oh. Yeah, so this is these are the kinds of things that, that I'm saying, but often it happens in a much more in a much more subtle way. Mm-hmm. And um, if you bring it up, people just get so upset they don't even want to talk about it. And um, yeah, so that is what's happened. That's that's what's that's what's that's what's happening here. That makes sense. Okay, thank uh, yeah. you for enlightening and me. Cause... Also, this idea of like the black community that doesn't that doesn't exist especially like there are many different communities Mm -hmm. um and also like the idea of like black 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 racial category categorization came from um european academic thought from Mm -hmm. the um from the 16th and 17th centuries Mm -hmm. where they created actual um a, a hierarchy of um categorizations of human beings to justify um, colonization, mm-hmm. um, but it's not like, but yeah. So like there, yeah, there was an actual like top down hierarchy mm-hmm. of um, so the idea of like quote unquote black is considered to be like or that I guess is like people sub people from who have who have their origins in, in sub Saharan Africa, mm-hmm. but. That is a huge freaking continent. Mm-hmm. And we're not only talking about people from the African continent, we're talking about people who like maybe have ancestry ancestral roots in the African mm-hmm. continent, but who also have like, you know, different cultural, you know, varying cultural experiences. So to put mm-hmm. all of these like, you know, really broad ways of knowing being expressing under one category mm-hmm. and the uh, the idea and the assumption that like there is one unified community mm-hmm. is also really par- problematic because yeah that's just one way of dehumanizing people who have who have a certain kind of phenotype mm-hmm. um, and for those of us um, those of us who are black or African Afro descendant who live here mm-hmm. on Turtle Island mm-hmm. or here in Vancouver mm-hmm. what's so-called Vancouver mm-hmm. there's a number of different reasons that we are here, a number of different kinds of relationships that we have mm-hmm. with the land here. Some people are people who have intentionally immigrated and said, yeah, like I'm gonna yeah, move here, or I'm gonna send my, you know, send my kid to university here, or whatever. I mean, so that person's kind of a different relationship with than with somebody who came here as a refugee. Mm-hmm. Or for somebody whose family has lived here for many, many, many generations. Mm-hmm. Or from somebody who um, is, um, um, who came here? So there was a program that happened in the in the sixties and uh, the fifties and sixties mm-hmm. um, by the federal government. It was called um, the domestic scheme. That's literally what it was called, the domestic scheme, where um, they were bringing women from um, from the Caribbean to Canada to work as domestics. So it's like if you worked X number of years as like as a maid in somebody's house or as a, as a domestic as a domestic worker, then you would get your citizenship after that. Mm-hmm. So like you know to be a descendant of people who came, you know, there's, so there's lots of different ways mm-hmm. of relating of having a relationship. So yeah, this idea that we all have a like yes, obviously like there is a shared history and a shared legacy, 
but we also have very different relationships to our reasons to be here. Mm -hmm. I don't remember where that was, what the, what, what that, what the initial thing that we were talking about was, but yeah, I think it's, I think it's just talking about mm, how segregation or how hierarchy yeah. separates and then um, in a way, because of like people in power who wants to stay in power, right? Or and and how this has a trickle effect. If we look at these things, there's these systems in place that we need to be more aware of because we can't navigate it. Um, we can't change and go against when something's been happening for so long and 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 and, and is still very big and part of uh, how we live and navigate through life. If we don't recognize it, how can we actually start properly navigating it to create safe spaces for people that aren't in the position of power, right? Who are not in, like, not seen as norm, right? Yeah. But and I also want to say, too, that power doesn't exist on a binary. It's not like there are these people in power than everybody else. No, like, we, we're, you know, it doesn't exist on a binary, and it's also contextual. So where you're, you know, if you're powerful in one space, that same person might not be powerful mm -hmm. in another space, but also that this idea that it's, if you're, and especially if you're feeling like you're not a person who's in power, that somehow you, like, oh, well, that's because of, that's because of them, mm -hmm. it's not because of me, and not really looking at how you are upholding these systems. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, talking about, like, you know, it's not that somebody, like, you know, up, you know, wherever mm -hmm. is like segregating people. Mm -hmm. No, like these the peer groups are yeah. actively acting out these, um, these things that they, that they have been, that they have been conditioned mm -hmm. to believe in ways that they've been, been conditioned to behave. But also because again, back to this whole, like, you know, West coast, this idea of like, Oh, we're so progressive and this and that, that, Kind of, okay, here we go. We'll go back to that place in conversation that we were talking about earlier, this idea of healing and being healed. Mm -hmm. Then you get to this space like, oh, no, I'm good. I'm good. And that's your identity of like being this healed. This is your, that's your identity of like this being this wise person, this being this healed person. And then if you have somebody that holds up a mirror to the places that you're not, mm -hmm. then it's really, and you already perceive yourself as, that clip popping is my this way. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and you already perceive yourself as somebody who is superior to that person who's holding up the mirror to you, mm -hmm. then it's going to be a personal affront to yourself, and then you're going to lash back out that person, and that just keeps perpetuating and perpetuating and perpetuating and perpetuating. And, yeah, uh, one of my favorite writers is James Baldwin, and there's this great quote that I love of his, um, and I bring it up all the time. <laughs> not everything, uh, sorry, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Mm -hmm. And I feel like West Coast BC is like, they don't want to face it because it's really comfortable to feel that, like to cling to this identity of being like more progressive than mm -hmm. everybody else. So like, you know that, so yeah, then that's when like the healing and the growth stops. Mm -hmm. I thank you for tying that all so well and so eloquently and I think it is important, like like you said, in order for each of us to really start making these shifts, is to start being aware and, and recognize our own discomforts. Mm -hmm. Because what you're talking about is like, you're right, it's not this person sitting at the top, like back in the dynasty, the emperor says, right? It's more like recognizing the systems and we're all in, and then recognizing in ourselves what brings those discomforts, right? Because when we can start recognizing it, we can start recognizing what's not working anymore, right? Mm -hmm. and we can start recognizing, ah, uh, how can we start creating things to navigate around these systems that are not working, mm -hmm. right? Um, also to bring back one thing that we were talking about before the camera started rolling, um, this piece around integration I have utmost respect for entheogenic beings and entheogenic medicines, mm -hmm. and I am very concerned about how 
people's relationships with them can sometimes even be I know, sorry, I'm going to try to rephrase that. That I just, okay, I'll just, I've witnessed it's like people who go to, you know, people go to Burning Man, they take LSD for the first time, they see the world in a new way, and then immediately it's like, okay, yeah, I have all, I have all the oh, answers. Yes, yes, yes. You know, I'm going to make this into my career. <laughs> like, you know, like, um, um, that there is a certain kind of humility that I feel is not being, um, yeah, that I, I, that I, I see a lot of this main, like the mainstream, um, um, embracing of like, of, of, psych, of psychedelics mm -hmm. substances. And this way I feel like they are being regarded as substance, substances that mm -hmm. are not really, that don't bring that humility piece into it. Um, and that people can think that, oh, well, I've done, I've done, I've, I've sat with, you know, I've sat for 10 ceremonies with, you know, <laughs> blah, 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 and I've gone to Peru and no, no, no. So like, you can't tell me that I'm not like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm above this. I'm above like, you know, the social systems. I, there's no way that, no, That's no. It's dangerous. Yeah. It's very dangerous. It is dangerous. Mm -hmm. And I see that play out yeah. a lot. So have I. Yeah. And, and, and in the field I am in. And that's why I, it's so important. I, that, that's why I, I'm so passionate about what I do in, in helping people integrate. And yeah. that's why I say I'm a specialist in integrating and preparing. Because yeah. it's not about so much the substances itself or like it's having reference for the medicine and they are teachers. But at the end of the day, when you have these amazing teachers teaching you and giving you these insights and experiences, but like anything, like when you go for a course and you're like, ah, I went to this workshop. I'm yeah. so inspired. But if you don't integrate and put them into practice, and they're just going to be like this inspirational moment in your life as an experience. Like you're going on a vacation and then you come back and then you go back to your everyday normal environment. Yeah. And that's it. And also if, the, you know, the community with which you're integrating, mm -hmm. if you're integrating with a group of people that all share and suffer from, but don't know they're suffering from, the exact same social malady, mm. you're not going to heal from it. Mm. It's when you have, when I, so this whole like diversity and inclusion, con uh, sorry, no, that was kind of trite, but the diversity and inclusion conversation, I feel so shallow because um, diversity exists. So it's not really about diversity in itself as existing, it's about um, agency within, uh, you know, for those different ways, ways of being and being able to understand that all of these things are necessary mm -hmm. and important and equally important. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea of inclusion, the way that I've seen it approach is that is that it's more, it's including people in a system that's already sick, mm -hmm. right? So I feel that when we talk about diversity, we need to be talking about like diversity of, of thought as well. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when you have competing, or wait, sorry, I don't know, no, not competing. When you have contrasting mm -hmm. ways of, um, you know, ways of seeing things or mm -hmm. ways of like experiencing the world, mm -hmm. that that can cause conflict. But I think that in that conflict and that tension is where like the deepest lessons are going to be learned. But it's mm -hmm. just, there's a, yeah. Yeah, if you... If you, if, if there aren't, yeah, in order to, I think, like, fully in, fully have, like, a healthy integration, it needs to be in a space where not only um, you are going to, your healing is going to be supported, but that also that your worldview is going to be challenged. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really important part of it, because if we're not being challenged and we're not, I mean, this whole thing is about, you know, shame, sh changing our perspective and, like, Girl. yeah, and, you know, the, um, having, um, you know, sh um, a different, uh, being in different states of consciousness, but that doesn't necessarily, that doesn't always need to mean like, you know, that we're taking medicine to do yeah. that. The medicine could also be yes. change, sh um, sh shifting our perceptions and changing our consciousness by being present with something that is going to maybe show us the things that we're not comfortable with mm -hmm. or challenge mm -hmm. our ways Challenge our understandings of why we think the way we think and why we behave the way we behave, and yeah. sometimes those things can very uncomfortable. Yeah, and yeah, and hurt. It sucks, <laughs> and I think that's where, you know, the most powerful growth and 
um, someone once shared is like, through suffering is where we really see beauty and, and really grow. And, and so it's not always going to be like a linear process and it's going to be beautiful. It's like, it's going to sometimes like slap in the face. It's mm-hmm. like, hey, this is, it's going to be painful and it's going to challenge you and, and it's up to each of us to be open to lean in and what is that challenging us to do. Like, for instance, I remember there was in this space that I, I, I met someone else and I just, I didn't know them, but right off the bat I was like, I don't like you. I didn't know them, but it just made me feel really uncomfortable. And then I, and then towards the end, I didn't judge them or anything. I just like, it just, I couldn't shake that feeling off. And then when I went away, um, it was many, 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 many months after. And so that's why I say healing and growth and learning is, and it's not linear. It was many, many months after, and then I, and I was going out for a walk, and then while I was walking, so integration can happen in many different modalities in different forms. So I was out on a walk, and then it suddenly dawned upon me, like, ah, I knew I, why I wasn't was so resistant to this person, I, and why I felt so uncomfortable, because there were parts that were mirroring back to me that I didn't like about myself, that I haven't fully accepted and, uh, within myself, that I also sh- was taught to feel shame, and I shamed mm-hmm. myself for it. And I was like, oh, that darkness or that heaviness or whatever I was feeling, I didn't want it to admit that I had that too. And so when I recognized that, I was able to soften to myself. And I was like, ah, those were pieces I didn't love in myself as well. Yeah. And then when I recognized that, I was like, oh, what a beautiful gift this person showed me. Mm-hmm. But I couldn't recognize that. I did reach out because I actually did re- exchange contacts with this person. Um, and then I, I did reach out and I was like, you don't need to respond back. This is what came up for me. And thank you for showing this so that I could heal this part of myself. Mm-hmm. You don't need to respond. And I wanted to be honest. M- maybe you felt it because I didn't share that I didn't like them or anything. But maybe you felt it. Or it's like this is what was going on for me. And long story short, it, she responded back and we're friends now. Mm-hmm. But it's like that discomfort, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite movies is Easy Rider. Mm. Um, I don't, have you seen that? No, I have not. Okay, so it's like classic, classic film. Well, I guess classic film, I guess. It was made in six. Oh. Oops. Uh, Let me adjust. Yeah. Maybe the camera's new. Yeah. <laughs> it's so tough. You got shot. Oh, we're good. We're good? Okay. Yeah. Uh, Easy Rider stars Peter, Fon- Peter Fonda and Jack Lemmon, okay. and it was shot in 1969. Also, Jack Nicholson's in it from oh. when he was really young. It was okay. one of his first roles. And um, it's one of, yeah, I, every time I watch that movie, I see, some, I see something new. But essentially, like, the story is that these two guys um, just land this major drug deal, like mm. co- cocaine deal, and they get tons of money, and they're like, okay, what are we going to do? They buy these choppers and drive across the United States to Mar- to to go to New Orleans to go to Mardi Gras. That's like the like the I guess the the premise of the story. But throughout their travels, they're examining or they're like encountering um, people who are living and existing on the fringes of society. Mm-hmm. But the reasons that they're doing this is that's where they're that's where they are the most the most free. So they're living outside of the like quote unquote. American dream Mm -hmm. and um it's also a reflection about like how mainstream America like well you know hippies you can call them like how hippies or like how people who were living their truth Mm -hmm. were actually reminders of the people who were like who were immersed in uh who were immersed in the mainstream it was sorry it was constant reminders of people who were immersed in the mainstream that they were not free Mm -hmm. so the people but didn't want that they were so resistant mm-hmm. to believing that so like there was violence and like mm-hmm. you know um ostr- ostracization right? and you can see that throughout history that like and this is these are archetypes that come up over and over again that people who are living in their true mm-hmm. in their truth mm-hmm. and people who are living in their authenticity mm-hmm. are often um yeah demonized but then later on, like after you know, after they've died, things you know, things might might change, and people will say their accolade, you know, will sing their praises. But yeah, it's people who are challenging the status quo, or who are living, who are being truly free, 
that are more a threat to the system than they are, than, um, sorry, if they, no, they are a threat, they are a threat to, to the system so that people seek to, to, yeah, to harm, to harm them so that rather than like accepting that truth in themselves and getting free themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's hard. It's hard. It's, it's, a, it's sometimes this, it's like a double-edged sword. It's like the system in itself, it's, we become so familiar with it. Sometimes it's almost like a, a, something that becomes a safety, quote unquote, because we know what to expect, uh -huh. and then it becomes a comfort zone. And then so to to move away from that can be uncomfortable, and our nervous system doesn't know this. So then, what we feel like is uncomfortable, unfamiliar, our nervous system might think is unsafe. Uh -huh. So then we want to like wash away from that feeling or walk away and remove ourselves from that discomfort and rather stay in what we are familiar with, even yeah. though it's not. And there are those who really don't have a choice. Yeah. That's right? True. That's and true. Um, my Angela Davis, I love Angela Davis, um, and one of the things that she talks about a lot is that if you're liberating a society, you need to liberate the people who are the most, you need to um, center um, and prioritize the leadership of the people who are most oppressed because they that option to like you know oh just I'm gonna they don't have that they don't have that That's option true. and they have lived experience and fully can see and understand the ways that mm -hmm. this that that society mm -hmm. is is harmful it's almost mm -hmm. like the whole canary in the coal mine mm -hmm. um I you know idea but yeah that and it and it, it makes sense so when we're talking about you know human you know human rights mm -hmm. when people say oh well you know like just you know conforming to the you know the the needs of the minority well no not really because if like you are yeah if you are raising up or you are supporting the liberation of the people who are yeah who are the who are the, the most susceptible to harm within a society you're there then lifting everybody up mm -hmm. whereas if you're only prioritizing the well-being of the people who are benefiting the most mm -hmm. You're actually widening the gap in everybody, mm -hmm. and everybody's purple. But it's that I, it's that empathy piece mm -hmm. that is missing. And again, like bringing in that idea of like separateness mm -hmm. and taxonomy and putting people into groups and mm -hmm. how identities are like are are um, a result. Certain identities are a result of a higher of, of hierarchical mm -hmm. or su mm -hmm. or a supremacist culture. Mm -hmm. Meaning, when I say supremacist, I mean like that one way of being is superior mm -hmm. to. Um, other all other ways of being um, yeah anyway I think that I, I, I lost the plot I lost the plot there a, a little bit but um, yeah that you know the there for people who there are people who don't have who don't really have anything to lose yeah yeah um, and it's the folks that still feel somehow that like they're getting little bits of benefits mm -hmm from like the ways that the system are are the ones that are least likely to be or like you know change yeah yeah because they yeah. because they see themselves as different or separate or better than higher up on the ladder and the part part of it is okay. that they're wanting to they think that they can like they're wanting to align themselves with power mm -hmm. but also the idea that if the dehumanization of, of the other mm -hmm. brings up fear because they know that they're not the other. It's the same. It's like that fear, kind of like what you're talking about, mm -hmm. seeing, you know, having that thing come up in, in, mm -hmm. in yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, I think uh, what we're all saying here at the end of the day is like, really you need to try to learn to lean into that discomfort and see what it's trying to teach you. Because that in itself, which is not a psychedelic, is a teacher. Yeah. Right? 100%. Yeah. And, and then I think, this might be a nice tie in as we slowly wrap up and before I ask you the last three questions yeah. that and um is that one other thing you also shared at that event that I was like, Oh, I wanna connect and talk mm -hmm. to you and know you more is um you said that, you know, oftentimes people see us of our ethnicity and they forget that we are a human being and person and an individual with our own identity. But they it's so easy to forget that and I was like, Oh, and that was so beautiful when you shared that. I was like, yeah, like we're not just what we look outwardly. We are a human being with experiences that 
you're more than just what is dictated by systems and yeah. Mm-hmm. So I really is there anything else you'd like to add to that? And once again I don't remember saying that. So, <laughs> <laughs> so see I have a bad memory when it comes to names, but when it comes to like lived experiences yeah. and stuff like that I'm really good at. Cool. Well thanks for thanks for reminding me. I sound like I was a smart person. <laughs> you, are, you are a very intelligent woman. Um yeah I, like to me that seems like a very fundamental like thing you learn in, in kindergarten like oh you know we're all we're all people and you know it's what's on the inside that, that counts. But I think that like just because we're told one thing doesn't mean that we're told one thing verbally but then we're conditioned subconsciously to see things yeah. To, to to behave to behave differently. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if I have anything if I, if I have anything more to say. That I hope that, that truth is self evident. That mm-hmm. like, and I hope that people can know from their own experience of being a human being that we are all mm-hmm. human beings. But I mean, that looks you know that idea of what what is human and what is the human experience. It's like it varies from it, it does. varies from person to person. There are so there's a multiplicity of factors that mm-hmm. are going to mm-hmm. yeah that will that will shape that, like, our relationship with the ideas of gender, our relationship with, our relationship with culture, mm-hmm. our relationship with, like, able, you know, how, you know, how, how our body navigates, mm-hmm. you know, like, moving through the world in our, in our bodies, like, there are a number of different, and uh, not only moving through the world in our bodies, but how the world perceives us based on our bodies yeah. as well, and then how we learn to respond and react and adapt to, and then also there's the whole epigenetics thing, and yeah. it goes on and on and on and on and it's on and on, and on and on. Yes. <laughs> so just recognizing that, right? And, yeah. Um, yeah. So thank you so much, and to uh, bring a close to our podcast today, um, I love to ask, and I'll ask all my um, guests these three questions. If you were right now in this very moment, and if you were able to go back in time, um, what is one word of advice that you would like to give yourself? Is it a cop out to say that I wouldn't? No, I wouldn't. I would love to hear more. Um, and it can be brief. <laughs> I, because I don't know where this is leading, and I don't know, like if you know those time travel movies, mm-hmm. like if you encounter yourself, you know, mm-hmm. people like never, never meet your, you know, your past self if you're going, you know, going, going back, you know, because it's going to change, mm-hmm. catastrophically change mm-hmm. the series of events. I actually don't know where my life is leading, mm-hmm. and, um. I it it might be leading somewhere super super awesome, mm-hmm. so I don't want to disrupt mm-hmm. that. And I also think that you know that state of becoming. The reason why I keep using that word is I was listening to a, a I was listening to a podcast last night about um, the archetype of the of the of the fool. Oh yeah. Um, and how the, and the fool being the number zero mm-hmm. in the card, and that zero being like infinity, and that mm-hmm. this con like being like cyclical, and this constant being constant state of being and the fool and I guess I related to it like as an you know as an autistic person that like you know the fool is somebody who's kind of like on the kind of like has a has a distinct role in like in society but is equally regarded as wise and as and as and as foolish mm-hmm. um and the person was that what's the quote I think it's Shakespeare is like the first the, the wise man or the fool sorry a wise man a man who thinks he is wise is actually a fool, but a, a wise man who is fool. Oh, I didn't remember. I don't remember. I don't remember what it is. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I think that the journey is the journey is the point. Mm, I love it. Yeah. You just tied it all together. It's like not attaching to outcome. <laughs> yeah. Right. And um, the second question is, what is something you're wanting to still explore or have yet to try that you're wanting to you feel called to? You mean as far as doing things or being things or it could be anything. What is something that I still want to do? Yeah. Or sorry, can you can you repeat the question? Yeah. What is something that you want to experience or do or you want to explore that you have yet to and you feel called to? And it could be anything. Whether it's like within you or externally, yeah. There's lots. I'm just trying to figure out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to um, and I feel.
feel like game of the becoming, I feel like I'm actually on this path already of like, yeah, I just want to keep learning about like who this person is. And I gain this like new way of this, this new framework with which and I'm under, within which I am learning to understand myself. I feel like I'm, yeah, like meeting myself for the first time and, and, and figuring that out. So I'm already, I'm already, I'm already doing it. Mm -hmm. Um, but also, I mean, I have some pro projects. Is that kind of like, okay, yeah. cool, yeah. So um, I, um, there's a few different projects that I'm doing simultaneously. So one, um, actually this is a good segue into what I want to talk about anyway. Um, mm -hmm. So um, I'm creating, or I will be host, I, I will be hosting this uh, series of events um, at my art studio. Mm -hmm. um, which are called, I'm calling solar punk salons. So salons were um, in the 16th and 17th century, um, you know, the aristocracy in Europe, mainly women would have these, this, this, like people having people over to the, the parlors or their salons of their homes to have just conversations about philosophy and um, um, sociology and different, and different kinds of things. And there were these like, yeah, a bunch of, they would invite people and they were, you know, intellectuals who would have these, who would have these conversations and explore these ideas. Mm -hmm. And the solar punk movement is that started, I guess, like in the early 2010s, like that term was coined and it started off as a genre of speculative fiction. I want to say it's like, um, eco, eco futurist. It is almost like an antidote to cyberpunk, which is a view of the future where machines are our evil overlords and we are fighting for our humanity. But solar punk is a view of the future where, um, technology helps us to be more human mm -hmm. and um, live with, um, like, abide by the, the rhythms of nature, mm -hmm. which is us. So that's mm -hmm. what I mean by being 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 more human. Mm -hmm. Also looks at things like um, sustainable um, sustainable social systems, um, uh, closed loop. Um, sorry, uh, cooperative cooperative economics. Mm -hmm. um, um, green technology, uh, green technology, renewable energy sources, that kind of thing. Um, so anyways, I'm hosting these solar punk salons starting, um, um, yeah, in just over a month. And, um, the idea would be for folks to be able to get together and we'll have certain, there is, um, there are several solar punk manifestos because solar punk also is like a growing and evolving idea and there's no like one right way to do it but there are different groups all around the world that have different ideas so like a lot of these things are available online so we'll look at different ideas mm -hmm. within these solar punk manifestos and not only discuss them but also be in community with one another where we eat together we make music together and we create art together where we're actually envisioning the future and this is one of the things i love about solar punk is that it's not this pie in the sky idea where like Oh, we need A, B, C, D for these things to be a reality. All that can be reality right now because we have everything that we need mm -hmm. to be able to live. But we, unless we can envision ourselves there, mm -hmm. we're not going to get there. Everything that is in, in that's in existence started off as an idea, mm -hmm. right? So when we are in getting in touch with our creative selves and we are expressing our creative selves, this helps us to propel us into envision. If you can't envision yourself um, as anything other than what you are currently experiencing, nothing is going to change. Exactly. Yeah. Um, can you give us an insight in, as to what one of those events may look like, or what? I know you mentioned three, so. Oh, like what the top, what the topics yeah. are? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, one, the one that I'm, so the first one that I will be, um, that I will be hosting um, is um, the person. So it's not a. You've heard me talk a lot about like supremacy and hierarchy. So a lot of the way that I'm trying to do these things is to challenge the ideas. Mm -hmm. So in the way we sit together, so I'm not going to have, it's not going to be a, like a lecture series where there's going to be somebody like giving a talk mm -hmm. and then we all, you know, no, it, th there'll be a person to help to guide the conversation mm -hmm. who has knowledge in a particular area, mm -hmm. but also we're going to assume that everybody has something to, to offer. Um, so yeah, the first one is, um, going to be led by and I'm oh sorry I've chosen the people based on my experiences with them and under and having observed how they show up in community and the mm -hmm. kinds of val you know, value that they add to the communities that they serve um, but I'm trying to like keep it open as to what exactly it is that they're going to do in the space so mm -hmm. the first person 
um, is, um, uh, her name is Hanifa Nio Washington, mm -hmm. and she um, is somebody like me who is a multi-hyphenate, mm -hmm. <laughs> so she is, um, yeah, she is a community builder, she is an artist, um, she's a historian, she um, is a, she's has lots of experience in nonprofit leadership. She's just like very, um, very skilled and experienced in a number of different spaces. But mm -hmm. when one of the first times I met her, um, she was um, she was uh, leading a course in reflective listening mm -hmm. and reflective listening as being like foundational to um, to healthy communities and healthy mm -hmm. systems. Um, she's also the co-founder. Um, she, uh, she, yeah, she was um, one of the co-founders of the Fireside Project, mm -hmm. which is um, a peer support psychedelic helpline, which is great. Um, so, you know, if somebody is having a difficult psychedelic experience or a challenging psychedelic experience, there is really nothing, as these medicines start to come into the mainstream, mm -hmm. the social systems that we have set up currently aren't really made to hold people who are having these experiences, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, if you're having a quote-unquote bad trip mm -hmm. and you call 911, mm -hmm. flashing light, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, you think you can yeah, the hospital. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, get these critical looks. And yeah. sometimes you just really need to have somebody, like, be there to hold you. Compassionately. Yeah, well, to be able to, like, Without judgment. and, yeah, yeah validate, like, yeah. in validation and just be present to your experience and just hold your experience as valid. So, mm -hmm. um... The fire, Fireside Project is an um, is, is a, yeah oh, it's all peer support mm -hmm. and the basis of the training for um, the people who are um, yeah so for, for the peers who are who are answering the phones um, is based in reflective listening so not trying to influence mm -hmm. you know the shape of somebody you know somebody's journey not like not judging it mm -hmm. not you know giving advice but just like being present and I think that a lot of the time especially in activist spaces, so many of us feel like we're not being heard, but nobody's listening. Mm -hmm. So I'm, um, yeah, I thought that that was really like what she, that that thing that she has to offer is really powerful. So I don't know if that's what she's gonna that's what mm -hmm. she's gonna bring into the space, but I'm I'm kind yeah. of I'm, I'm hoping yeah. I'm hoping that's that's yeah, the case. Yeah, that's amazing. I look forward to that. Now. Yeah. So the the plan is to have them um, once a month on the last Sunday of every month Tremendous. and I'm trying to make it so that um, it's um, that it's financially accessible to whoever Beautiful. whoever wants to come yeah and um, how do people find out more about it do they follow you on social media Instagram or is there a website yeah so my website is Naomi Grace um, I it's in progress so my like the official launch of like the whole site will be um, either at the end of June or beginning of July mm -hmm. I'm also going to be doing a small event um, at the studio okay. um, for that. Um, my Instagram is at naomi.v.grace. Mm -hmm. I'm also on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. I just joined TikTok. Um, I don't really post there too much, but it's okay. at artsy fartsy rabble rouser. That's my Insta that's my TikTok that. yeah. handle. Yeah. Okay. And then we'll include that in the, in the show notes as well, so it's easier for people to find. Um, and the last question as we come to a close is, the moment you're showing up in the world right now, this present moment, um, what is one word? And it can change. It will change. And just this present moment right now, uh, give it be one word or one sentence. Um, how would you describe this embodied version of you right now of Michael? I said it before and I'll say it again. Becoming. I love it. Becoming. Becoming. Thank you so much. Thank you for being on this podcast and highlighting so many different beautiful insights and things that we're not very forefront mindful of and conscious of and I think it's important so and sharing your story thank you so much for yeah inviting me to participate and also thank you so much for reflecting back to me some of the things that I've said that I've I've said that I, I forgot because uh, yeah I'm gonna yeah I'm gonna reflect on those a little yeah. bit sometimes I'll go back and I'll read you know old journal writings and I'll be like oh that was really insightful <laughs> so that it, I felt almost like you were doing that for me it's like uh, that thing about the I'm not good at remembering me, but I do love you. Thank you, Johnny. And see. <laughs>
This has been a Hot Pod Pod production brought to you by Lucinor, a premier online psychedelic community. Wander your mind at lucinor.net.